Hey guys, Ega here. For today's video, we're taking a look at something a bit different. Something that I've been meaning to do a video about for a long time now. The Ploopy headphones. Almost one year ago, I made a video about their open source trackballs and I really appreciated their unique approach to design and use of 3D printed parts. So today, let's explore their planar magnetic headphones and see how these 3D printed cans compare against traditional mass market options. We'll go over what makes them tick, what they feel and sound like, and last but not least, some mods and customization. Like all Ploopy products, the headphones can be ordered either pre-assembled or as a much cheaper option, a DIY kit, which comes in at 120 Canadian dollars or a little under 100 US dollars. Of course, a lot of the appeal for me has to do with the fact that the project is open source and the entire construction of the headphones is made out of 3D printed parts. So let's jump straight into it. As is the case with all Ploopy products, you get all the parts thrown together in Ziploc bags, no fancy box or neatly organized parts here. Fortunately, the assembly guides are very well made, instructions are clear, concise and broken up into milestones. The first step, and the only one that requires any special tools, is soldering the jacks to the planar magnetic driver boards. There's very little soldering actually needed, and I think a lot of people would prefer if these came pre-soldered, as the rest of the kit doesn't require special tools. Once that's done, we're instructed to add double-sided sticky tape to the driver flex boards. I know it sounds a bit strange, but it will get even stranger. We use a jig to place our sticky taped boards inside the driver back, and then carefully peel off the backing tape. Next up, we add a pre-cut piece of foam. The idea here is that the driver boards will end up being glued to the foam, which will in turn act as a sort of membrane. This is pretty wacky stuff, like I said. A ring is then added to secure the foam in place and provide tension. This step is pretty important, as the ring needs to be pressed down evenly onto the foam and only released when all the screws are fully tightened. I am really not a fan of self-tapping plastic screws, and I really would have liked to see heat set threaded inserts used here. This is something I'll probably say every time I assemble a Ploopy product. Once the ring is secure, we make sure the alignment of the driver board is correct. Not that we can do anything about it once the driver boards are glued to the foam. Next up, we add the outer ring and secure it with six more screws. We're now ready to move on to my least favorite part, the magnet array. Inserting the magnets has to be done in a very particular order so that we end up with the correct polarity for all the magnets. There isn't anything complicated or difficult about it unless your magnets are undersized for the 3D printed parts like mine ended up being. This however is a known issue, I guess due to randomness in magnet thickness. I had to wrap each magnet in some captain tape to make them actually sit in place. Not the most enjoyable part of the build process, I can say that much. Once the magnet holders are secured to the drivers, we are done with this milestone, and all said and done, so far it's a very neat and simple design, with a touch of jank thrown in, but that's part of the charm I guess. Next up, assembling the ear cups. Ploopy opted for a toolless design for these, which is nice. Any opportunity to not use self-tapping screws is a win in my book. For assembly, we have some foam, a weird sock, and the 3D printed parts. We do have to use a glue stick to fix the sock to the inner ring, but fortunately this is less messy than it sounds like, and it's not as permanent of a thing as it sounds either. It's more of an aid to keep the sock in place and make installation easier. The ring sits snugly into a recess of the ear cup base, the sock then gets flipped inside out, folded over the foam, and finally secured with another ring on the other side. The sock easily frays at the ends, and it isn't the most pleasing thing to work with, but I appreciate the simplicity and ingenuity of the design of the ear cups. The resonator is our last piece of the ear cups, and this part just snaps into place. It may look rather plain from the outside, but if we take a look at the section view of the 3D model, we discover that it's quite intricate, with an array of what I assume are some sort of resonant chambers. The ear cups themselves attach to the drivers with a bayonet style mount, again simple and effective. The driver holders and headband are the next assembly milestone. All the moving parts use metal dowel pins, and I really appreciate that Ploopy decided to go with this solution here. Every part that swivels does so very smoothly, and even more importantly, it does so silently without any odd creaks or squeaks. If there's one design element that can be considered a Ploopy signature, it's the use of compliant mechanisms. Take these flexible tensioners for example, they go on each side of the headband to provide the tactile feedback when adjusting the fit of the headphones. The flex bars that connect the two symmetrical sides are another example of Ploopy's experience with flexible designs. I went with the medium clamping force option here and proceeded to assemble the rest of the headband by adding the last remaining piece of foam and the final sock. Finally, I added the signature Ploopy triangle logos to the side of each driver. 
but we're not quite ready to plug them in yet. The Bloopy headphones also come with an amplifier board. There's minimal assembly needed here, but this is a key part of the experience. There's a heavy EQ pre-applied in the signal chain that's integral to the sound of the headphones. We'll get into why that's important a bit later. So with that out of the way, we're almost done. There's only the cable left. The kit includes everything you need in terms of cables as well, but you still have some legwork to do. The Bloopy headphones use balanced cables, and it's a good idea to braid these to protect against electromagnetic interference. The cables then go into a Y splitter that connects to the headphone out of the amplifier board. Unfortunately, the included splitter cable in my kit turned out to be faulty, causing noise and distortion in one of the channels. Luckily, I managed to find a spare in my box of random audio cables. So with the cable braided and everything confirmed working, the assembly is officially complete and I have to say it was a lot of fun. It satisfies that Lego for adults itch, and for me, that kind of thing never gets old. Seeing a pile of random looking parts fit together into an actual working thing never ceases to bring me substantial levels of joy and a feeling of accomplishment. The finished headphones look absolutely great. The quality of the 3D printed parts could be a bit better, but I'm nitpicking really. What does stand out immediately is how great these are in terms of build quality. You'd expect them to be flimsy, but far from it. I'd even go as far as to say that these feel better than many entry-level or even mid-range real headphones. And even more importantly than that, they are super comfortable. Granted, they are big and the clamping force isn't the strongest, you're definitely not going to go out on a walk wearing these. But for home listening, the low clamping force combined with their relatively light weight make for a very comfortable experience. Once you play some music, however, the first thing you notice is that they aren't the loudest headphones out there. I have the latest firmware installed, which has a built-in EQ preset from Oratory1990, targeting the ideal Harman curve for headphones. I'll have a link down in the description to Oratory's collection of headphone presets if you're interested in learning more about this. This latest firmware also has support for the Bloopy Toolbox, an app developed by GitHub user George Norton. It allows for live adjustments to the processing done by the DAC in the amplifier board, as well as saving presets and a bunch of other settings. This is not only a nice to have, but as far as I'm concerned, it's an integral part of configuring your pair of Bloopy headphones. With my particular build, I had to reduce the preamp gain by 5.5 decibels to eliminate audible distortion. This in turn made the headphones even quieter than they were in their stock configuration. Don't get me wrong, it's not a complete deal breaker. For most music, they probably get louder than what's considered a safe listening volume, but I often find myself reaching for an invisible volume knob, especially on tracks with a quieter mastering. So with that out of the way, let's get into the nitty gritty. What do these actually sound like? First of all, I'm more of a speaker guy. I have a pair of Kef LS50s with an active sub in my office and a pair of Dali Spectre 2s for my vinyl setup. For the times when I do feel like listening to headphones, I pick up my Sennheiser 6XXs. But the Sennheisers use dynamic drivers, whereas the Bloopies use planar magnetic drivers. It wouldn't exactly be an apples to apples comparison. Not to mention that the 6XXs are probably an unfair opponent, as they are considered by many to be one of the best audiophile grade headphones. So instead, together with Void, we had a listening session in which we compared the Bloopy headphones to his pair of Hi-Fi Man HE400SE. These can be had for about the same price as a kit of Bloopy headphones and are widely regarded as the best entry-level to planar magnetic headphones. We listened to a number of tracks from different genres and wrote down our preferences and findings. First of all, it has to be said that the Bloopy headphones excel in the low end, delivering powerful and very low-reaching bass. We both agreed that once you have them on, you simply forget that they are 3D printed headphones. Where they do fall apart, however, is in the mid-range and we were both in agreement on this as well. They lack a certain bunchiness and body to their sound. Electronic music tends to suit them a bit better, but still, in a direct comparison, we both preferred the Hi-Fi Mans to the Ploopies on every track that we listened to. But on their own, they aren't bad at all. If you're even a bit interested in the DIY 3D printed aspect, then there will be no regrets with the Bloopy headphones, and this is where things get a bit more interesting. Given that the project is open source and the headphones are almost entirely made out of replaceable parts, there's opportunities for customization and modding. So here's what I did. First things first, I modified the existing designs and added holes for heat set threaded inserts everywhere to be used with M2 and M3 screws. No more self-tapping plastic screws, thank you very much. Then I fired up my Voron 3D printer and printed all the headband parts in PETG carbon fiber for a matte black high quality finish and all the driver parts in red ASA filament 
to serve as the accent color. Next up, I've replaced the magnet holders with a mod by GitHub user Cab404 that optimizes volume output by placing the magnet array closer to the driver flex boards. It also opens up the back of the headphones even more and exposes the magnet array from the outside, in the process giving the headphones an entirely new look. Reassembling the headphones with the new printed parts is pretty easy, but it's important to remember to use the driver mounting jig to support the foam and driver assembly before adding the inner ring. An added benefit of using heat set inserts everywhere is that you get to use fancy screws, like the Torx head screws I used for the magnet holder. It just makes the headphones look a lot more refined and premium, if you will. With the magnet mod, the headphones do indeed get louder, but there's a trade-off here. With the magnets closer to the driver, you can end up in situations where the driver hits the magnet array, resulting in a clicking sound, particularly on songs with deep bass. Still, with the mod installed, I do regain some of the loudness I lost by having to reduce the preamp gain, so it's a net win in the end, but it's not a dramatic difference. Let's talk a bit more about the EQ and the amp board. You can actually plug these straight into any amp or even a laptop. But if you do that, the limitations of 3D printed headphones become immediately apparent. What you'll hear will be an extremely uneven frequency response that's very bottom heavy with unnatural levels of bass. Whereas a traditional headphone manufacturer will aim for a natural frequency response achieved through careful choice of materials and advanced design capabilities, the Bloopy headphones instead rely on heavy EQing to achieve a natural response. You can actually skip the amp board if you want to by using a parametric EQ app and copying Oratory's EQ settings to achieve the exact same sound without the amp board. But there's no way to use them without the amp board or a dedicated parametric EQ app, which is a shame as I would have liked to be able to listen to my record collection, for example. Anyway, time for some conclusions. If you're at all interested in 3D printing and audio, or you're just looking for a fun DIY project to do on your own or with someone else, then I think this is definitely something that fits the bill. For me, I thoroughly enjoyed building and tinkering with the Bloopy headphones, and I suspect I will tinker with them some more in the future. The sound could be a bit better, but again, they are fantastic headphones all things considered. The build quality is crazy good and one of the most comfortable headphones I've tried so far. The Hi-Fi Man HE400 SEs, for example, feel a lot less sturdy in comparison, and a lot more fragile, which seems like a crazy thing to say, but truly it isn't, the design of the Bluebee headphones is that good. The only remaining question mark I have has to do with all the non-printed parts, in particular the driver foam and the ear and headband socks, it remains to be seen how well these hold up with time. I'm also somewhat disappointed that there hasn't been further development. They came out more than a year ago, and other than the initial firmware updates, there haven't really been any new developments. This is a criticism I have with Bloopy in general, they seem to come up with cool and interesting products that they never really revisit or update with quality of life changes, like updating their older trackballs to use USB Type-C for example. But really, I'm nitpicking and I hope they continue doing what they're doing as they are two super talented designers and makers. That's all for this one, it was a long time in the making, but I'm super excited to hear what you guys think down in the comments, and do let me know what you think about this type of content, and if you'd like to see more of it in the future. Bye for now, and see you guys in a new video real soon.